Hey there, my name is Justin. I'm one of the pastors at Hope City. I'm really glad you're checking out this week's message. I hope you'll take a minute, look around our website, visit our YouTube channel, and download the Hope City app by searching Hope City Indy in the App Store or Google Play Store. There's great content on the app that goes far beyond weekend services. Hope City is a place where you can belong before you believe. No matter where you come from today spiritually, I hope this message helps you find hope and move closer to Jesus. Enjoy the message. Hey Hope City, I'm Sarah and I'm going to be hanging with you all day. I'm excited for a great day today of worship and teaching. We are in a series called Befriend that teaches us how we can be long in an era of judgment, isolation, and fear. I'm so excited that you're here. Let's get ready to worship. Hey, good morning Hope City. We're so glad that you're here with us. We invite you now to just stand and worship with us. my fall and lifts me time and time again. Oh my God, so good. You never give up. You never give up on me. Oh, what joy I found because of your love. Because of your love on me. Oh my God, so good. You never give up. You never give up on me.
guys to continue worshiping with us today. His mercies are new every morning, so we always have a reason to praise Him. Let's sing this out, I search the world. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. There's nothing. Oh, there's nothing.
Happy Sunday, Hope City. I'm Sarah, and I am so excited to be with you today. If this is your first time to Hope City, we are really glad that you're here with us today, and we want to connect with you. So take a quick moment to text new here to the number on the screen so we can say hello and welcome you to Hope City. Okay, well, a few weeks ago, we introduced our Connect 15. This is 15 seconds for you to get as social as you can. Say hello in the chat, wave to a neighbor, follow us on Instagram. You have 15 seconds. Connect 15 starts now. Jesus throughout our entire community. Hey, I have a few announcements of fun things coming up here in the next few weeks. First is today is our Intro to Hope City class happening at 12.15 p.m. This is a great class if you are new to Hope City. It lets you meet our pastors and ask questions. I highly recommend that you attend. If you have any questions, just text intro to the number on the screen. And finally, next Sunday is our Students' Night. I am so excited for this. Students' Night is my favorite night of the month. It's for middle school and high schoolers. And I want to invite any student to join us at 6 p.m. Just text students to the number on the screen. Well, guys, I'm so glad that you're here for another great week. Welcome to week three of Be Friends. Well, hey, Hope City, how's everybody doing? All right, I want to say a huge shout out to those of you who are watching online. If you're in your PJs, you are winning Sunday. I want to say a huge shout out to those of you in the room. Thank you for being here today. Hey, before we dive into today's message, let's just talk about Valentine's Day. Right. If you were here last week and you heard Justin uh, speak on Valentine's Day, for those of you who are new to Hope City, uh, Justin is not only uh, our lead pastor of Hope City Church, he happens to be my favorite human on the planet, my husband of 25 years. And in the 25 years, Valentine's Day, I just I think it should be illegal. I think we should get rid of it. And I have very choice words I cannot use in this moment about it. But on Valentine's Day last week, we decided again at like our 26th attempt that we were going to make this Valentine's Day incredible. And we did. We went to dinner. The dinner was yummy. It was so good. And part through dinner, I just realized that Justin just did not seem himself. And I was like, wait, we're winning. What's going on? Um, and it kind of took a turn where he went from really not being himself that I could tell that something was uh, very wrong. And so we went to the emergency room and his blood pressure was dangerously high to the point that we thought maybe he was having a mild heart attack. And we are very grateful to say that he hasn't and he didn't, um, but that he is in a place physically that it has been a huge wake up call. And so he is taking the next couple of weeks off and here's uh, two things I want to say. The first thing I want to say is I am enamored with my husband. He is brilliant. He is one of the smartest people I have ever met. He, he makes magic out of nothing. And his passion is unwavering. And he literally could do anything with his life. He could be a millionaire. I'm like, come on right? Like, I don't have that capacity. He does, like a multimillionaire. He is just that smart, but he loves the church, and he is passionate about helping people find hope and follow after God, and that comes to the second half. Ministry is hard. Ministry was hard way before 2020 and into 2021, and ministry is hard, 
And so I am so proud of him. I am grateful that he practices what he preaches in his authenticity. Some of you got the email. For those of that you didn't, now you know what's going on. And I just want to say, church, you're incredible. I absolutely am amazed how you have rallied and you have encouraged and we have grown deeper and closer in the midst of this. We're going to talk about that today. Um, Tracy Shostak, who oversees, uh, leads our care ministry, she reached out and she's like, what do you need? Do you need a meal train? I'm like, no, we're good. We're good. We're fine. You know, um, don't worry about it. And I don't think she listened because then we ended up getting um, all of these, these notes and words of affirmation. That's Justin's love language. And then we started getting like gift cards to, you know, get food, which is not cooking dinner is my love language. So it's been in, incredible and we have felt so loved. And so you may be thinking, what can I do? What, what can we do to rally? And what I want to say is keep doing what you're doing. Keep showing up. Keep loving. Keep giving. Keep partnering together because Hope City Church is not about one person. And it is not about one staff. Hope City Church is about a community of faith who believes radically in a Jesus who brings hope to a hurting world. Amen? Amen. So with that, we are going to dive into this topic that we have been talking about for the past few weeks. We are in week three of a six-week series that has been birthed out of this book called Be Friend by our friend Scott Sauls, and the subtitle is pretty intense. How to Create Belonging in an Age of Judgment, Isolation, and Fear. Hello. Like, I mean, these are intense conversations that we're having, and we're asking ourselves why. Why do we need to befriend one another? Why do we have to have relationships? Why do we need community? And what we've realized in asking this question, we found ourselves standing on this foundational truth that in order for you and I to befriend one another, we have to first befriend ourselves. You may think, I don't know what that means. I had a conversation with a sweet friend this week, and I just challenged her that I've noticed of late that she is um, extremely and unfairly critical of herself. And when we were having the conversation, I realized that I recognize this in others very quickly because I am a recovering, self-criticizing addict. It's true. Say that five times. Right, like I spent so many years in my 20s and into my 30s being so critical of myself that it would like paralyze my ability to befriend other people. It, 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 would be, it would hurt how I would view myself and the things that I thought that I was able to do. And I have spent a lot of work and really feel like that I have figured this piece out that I don't live from that place. But boy, does it rear its ugly head. In fact, a couple Sundays ago, I was uh, supposed to be uh, leading worship. Well, I was leading worship, and during run-through, you could just tell that I was a mess. And we sat down as a team, and we, uh, every Sunday, those who serve on this stage, they pray for you, and we pray for each other. And in that prayer, it was obvious that I was the elephant in the room. And I don't know about you, if you're like me, that when I feel messy, I look for the rug, right? I'm just going to sweep it under. It was like I was trying to fit my messy elephant under the rug, and it was like an elephant under a bath mat. Like, it was, it was obvious that I was not put together. And in order for us to befriend one another, we have to be willing to befriend ourselves. It means we have to show each other grace, we have to show our self-grace first. We have to be willing to recognize that we are worthy. When you are messy and your mess spills over to other people, it is okay if your mess is not convenient. You are worthy of being not put together. When you befriend yourself, you take a deep breath and go, okay, it's okay that I process this. This is okay that I am not perfect. That's when we begin to befriend ourselves. And befriending yourself is living from this foundation that you are radically loved by God. 
So when you think about it, where do you find yourself on that scale? Because we're going to talk about befriending others, but how do you feel you befriend yourself? You see, Jesus befriended you before you chose to be friends with him. And he is the most gracious, trustworthy best friend you will ever have. And so as we talked about this topic, if we are grounded in the knowledge that we have to first befriend ourselves in order to befriend others, Justin talked about these different ways that we befriend one another, how we have proximity to each other. We have the digital friendships. You know, these are the ones that are online space, and maybe you saw somebody's Instagram, and you like what they post, and so you often comment on that, and then they respond, and then you're like, we're friends, we're digital friends, it's awesome. We've never met in real life, but we're close friends, right? Then you have the transactional friendships. These are ones, none of these are bad, they just are. These are the ones that, you know, the, the nurse or the doctor that you see often, it's a friend, you trust them with, you know, your life, literally. It's the person at the grocery store that is the same clerk that works at your favorite store and, and you say hi, right? It's that person who works in the same building as you, but on a completely different floor. It's transactional. You befriend them and you, you say hi, then you have this one-dimensional friendship, and this is created out of common interest, maybe even season of life. You know, it, you have playdates created with people that, you know, they're little people like your little people, and so the big people start hanging out, right? There's this, there's this one common thing that brings you together. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I decided to find a gym that wasn't like just one specific like workout. I was doing uh, Orange Theory for a season and I kept on getting injured and then there was like nothing else to do. So I decided to join a gym where I can swim, which I love swimming, which I could run, which I like running, um, which I can do weights, which I hate. In fact, I have a, a trainer that I meet on Mondays. His name is Ben and I'm like, okay, Ben's gonna get me excited about weights. Nope, I hate it. So I realized that this place not only has a pool and places to run, they have classes. And they have this class that I fell in love with back in Nashville, Tennessee, where we lived, a dance class called Zumba. Now, my instructors in Nashville were legit. Like, they, they, it was like, it was for real. And then when I moved here, no offense, Indiana, but the, the Zumba class I was going to, you could tell it was like the leftover class nobody wanted, but they learned it anyway. And I was like, just nah. So I decided to check out the Zumba class at my new gym. And I walk in, and before me stood the most beautiful, Hispanic, gorgeous, Zumba queen instructor I've ever seen in my life. And before my like insecurity made me beeline for the exit, she said hi to me and I was totally swooned. I'm like, hi, and she was so nice to me. And then I looked around and like, it was like everything I want the church to be. It was multi-ethnic, like multi-multi-ethnic. It was crazy. And it was multi-generational. I had a man in his mid-70s to a girl in her young 20s. And they all liked each other and they were talking. And then like an unspoken, you know, like signal that the party was going to begin. The music starts playing and I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, I'm like, I'm certain that if I close my eyes and I open them, I'm going to be on a cruise ship in the middle of the ocean. It was a party. It was so much fun. And then afterwards, like literally my cheeks hurt so much from like smiling. And then when the, it was over, people grabbed their masks and they lingered. They, they started chatting with each other. They were, they were asking each other how their day was going. And then this week, my instructor, she had a, a really tragic loss in her life. In my class, they brought her flowers and gifts. It was so sweet. And I thought to myself, these are my people. I love these people. But at the end of the day, my Zumba class is still a one-dimensional friendship. Right? They are not coming to see me. They are coming because we have this shared experience that we love to do dance together. And all of these types of befriending, they're all valid. The problem is, is every single one of them have a lid. And they have a, a stop and gap that does not allow them to move to a place and a relationship for it to go deeper, 
for it to be a meaningful relationship that is transformative. Why? Because transformative friendships, this type of friendship, to be fully known, to be fully loved, to go to the hard spaces in life, it is a call to give more than one dimension. It is multifaceted in every way. It is more than a transaction or a common shared experience. It is a willingness to be devoted to giving love unconditionally. Have you ever asked yourself why relationships are so hard? Right? Why are people so difficult? If you haven't, you are probably the difficult person. I'm just saying. Like, you know, like when you think about relationships, why are they so incredibly difficult? And the reality is no matter what type of friendship you find yourself in, it always begins with a pouring out. It will cause you to give something. So if you walk into the bank and the bank teller is like, you say, hi, your expectation is that he's going to say what in return? Thank you. Yeah. And if he doesn't say hi in return, you're like, okay, I'm going to the next one, right? Like there's this expectation in us, even if we don't acknowledge it in friendships, that when we give, there is an expectation that we will receive. And we see this in the Garden of Eden. God loved Adam and Eve so much that he gave them the power to choose his friendship and love. He gave them the choice to eat the fruit from the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Why a tree? Why did God give Adam and Eve a choice from the very beginning? Why did he give that gift? Because trust is the foundation of all relationships. This is where we start. This is the foundation. That we need to be able to trust each other enough to believe that we will choose one another. And then what happens? Satan begins to whisper these lies. And in these lies, Eve begins to think, hmm, what if God isn't trustworthy? What if he is holding out? You see, Eve wasn't able to see that the tree was a gift of love and not a gift to withhold. And this is where we start with relationships, where trust is built. This is how friendship should have been, where we are walking with God in the cool of the day, where we are fully known and fully loved. But when sin entered the narrative, it changed the friendship plan. And we try to make sense of friendship, and we try to make sense, why is it so hard? Why do friends do things that wound us? And we try to reconcile ourselves to this false theology of what we believe friendship is. And it's this theology of perfect. Because you have convinced yourself that you are a pretty perfect friend. And that because you're a perfect friend, Your friend should be perfect too. And some of you are going, no, I mean, I recognize it. Hmm, until, until that friend wounds you or does something like, what in the world? Why would she do that? Why did he choose that? Why would they do that to me? It's this place where we are always shocked when we fail one another. And then after the shock wears off, you get to this place, and we've all done it, right? Where we're like, I'm done. I'm done pursuing friendships because people are messy. People are messed up. And I'm not going to give and keep giving when I'm not going to get anything in return. And so I want you to take a minute and think about your your closest relationships. Your your top, your VIPs, your top three. If you have more than five, you don't have close friends. I'm talking about like your people. If if things hit the fan, who are you going to call? And when you think about those relationships, are they in a state of health? Are they healthy relationships? Or are they dysfunctional? Now, it's rhetorical. Don't answer it because the dysfunctional relationship may be sitting next to you, right? But think about it. Where are your relationships? Are they at a place of health? Or are they at a place of dysfunction? And here's the bad news about friendship. This is true. Look at what it says in Romans. It says, For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. That's the bad news. 
The good news is for all. For all have sinned, meaning no one is perfect. We are always going to fall short of giving God the glory. We are always going to fall short with one another. And to cultivate friendships where we are fully known and fully loved, we have got to address the sin issue. We, we've got to acknowledge that sin is a part of the equation. And when we try to be perfect or have perfect relationships, what happens is we focus on trying to reconcile the act of sin against us rather than reconcile with the person who sinned against us. Or we get so focused on the thing that they did this to us that we try to reconcile that sin. But here's the truth. Sin will never make sense in friendship because it was never part of the original plan. Right? Sin will never make sense. Because it wasn't a part of the original plan. It wasn't supposed to be this tension in our relationship. The only perfect relationship you will have on this side of heaven is through God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The God, Jesus, the, the Trinity, that you have a, a, a faithful trio that is for you, that will not let you down. That's where you find perfection. Look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11. It says, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. This is like the hinging statement. That because of Christ, even though we are messy with sin, and sin isn't supposed to be a part of our narrative, but it is, it says that Christ changed everything. Right? He has brought, through himself, he has brought us peace. He united Jews and Gentiles. So unless you are of Jewish heritage, you would be considered a Gentile. So the people of God found through the Old Testament and then the Gentiles, and Jesus changed everything. He said he united Jews and Gentiles into one, one people, when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of the law of his commandments. We're talking about the Old Testament law, the Ten Commandments, and the other 400 with it. He's saying he's changing all of this and the regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two groups together as one body. Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of death on the cross, and our hostility towards each other was put to death. Church, that's our hope. Our hope is, yes, we are going to be messy people. We are going to sin against each other. We're going to frustrate each other. We're going to disappoint each other. But Jesus changed everything. And he is so passionate about this reconciliation and us having these meaningful relationships that he was willing to send his son to the cross for our forgiveness so that we will be reconciled to him and reconciled to each other. And what Scott says in his book, he says that reconciliation isn't an option for Christians. It's a moral command. I would say it this way, that friendship isn't an option for Christians because it's the essence of Christianity. And so how do we reconcile? And we see this in the story of Adam and Eve, that when sin entered the narrative of friendship, what did God do? Not only did he go searching, it was in that moment that he declares that Jesus is coming and he's going to set things right. And he didn't stop there. Later on in verse 20, it says that God went and he, he killed an animal and he took the animal skin and he clothed Adam and Eve. See, even when we failed God, God still had a plan. And so if you feel frustrated in relationships, if you feel let down, if you feel tired in relationships, I'm telling you, God has got your back. That he knows and he still pursues. And when we recognize we are broken and messy and that our friends are broken and messy, we have to make a choice. We have to choose if we are willing to go beyond the one-dimensional, 
Go beyond the transactional, the easy digital friendships, and do the hard work of love. You see, friendship will always hinge on our willingness to give the gift of unconditional love. Trust is built when we can mess up with each other and still be loved. Trust is built when we can tell each other how we, we have messed up and we don't have the answers and still know that you are going to remain a true friend. You see, trust is the foundation of friendship. But if trust is the foundation of friendship, forgiveness is the conduit to that transformational friendship. You see, transformational friendship isn't dependent on common likes. It's not dependent on season of life. It's a relentless pursuit of reconciliation forged by forgiveness. And so you're probably thinking what I'm thinking. Like, okay, I probably already knew that. The struggle is, how do we forgive? Like, how do we lend ourselves to this forgiveness and not feel like we're being tumbled in, in the wounds over and over again? How do we choose to forgive? And Jesus knew we would struggle with this. And we're going to look at a passage where Jesus is sharing this story to his disciple Peter. And we pick it up in verse 21. And this verse always makes me laugh. Some of you have heard me share this story. It says that Peter came to him, Jesus, and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? And he says seven times. Well, why this is so funny is that in those days, the Jewish priests, you know, the commands, the old commandments that we read in that first piece of scripture, they taught, the Jewish rabbis taught, you only had to forgive a person three times. Does that sound amazing? Three times, three strikes. You're I mean, we would have zero friends, but it would be awesome. And so he's saying, you know what, I'm going to one-up the rabbis, and I'm going to throw out the number seven. Why, I have no idea. Then Jesus responds, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Why? This isn't a mathematic equation. Thank you, Lord. What he's saying is that forgiveness will be a process. It will be a process with layers that will be hard to sift through. It will be a process of grief and going through those different stages of grief. But he didn't stop there. He decided to share the story. And so he begins the story that is titled The Unmerciful Servant. And he says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to. I want you to remember this. This isn't just a story, but Jesus is saying, this is about the kingdom of heaven can be compared to. So the kingdom of heaven is like in the area of forgiveness. Compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors would, were brought in who owed him a million dollars. And what was the dude doing? He couldn't pay it, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. I mean, this was like a hardcore moment. Like, we think about being forgiven about our debt, it's just, you know, like a cash thing. This was like, this man was getting ready to lose everything. His kids, his wife, all of it was about to disappear. And then the story continues. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. But then the master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave him of his debt. End of story. Right? This is a beautiful moment. The dude owed the king millions of dollars, right? And the king's forgiving of the debt meant that he still had that hole. Like, it wasn't going to get recovered with that cash. He was forgiving him. And you would think that someone who has been forgiven of such a great debt, that it would be transformative to their heart, that they were forgiven, that now they would forgive others. But look at what happens. It says, but when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant. So like this Jesus is saying, he's being dramatic. He's saying, like, immediately after being forgiven this debt, the servant went to his fellow servant who owed him just a few thousand dollars. And he grabbed him by the throat and he demanded instant payment. And just like the story before, it goes on. 
his fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it. The same words that the servant had said to the king. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. Now just time out for a minute. When we read the story, all of us who are like all about justice, we are like, oh my goodness. What is going on with this guy? Right? It goes back to that theology of perfect. I would never do that. I would never receive such great forgiveness and then choose not to forgive somebody else. And the story goes on. When some of the other servants saw this, they were like, what? Very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called to the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant. I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have the same thing? Mercy. I showed you great mercy. Shouldn't you have the same mercy on your fellow ser servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he paid his entire debt. And then he ends with this statement. That's what my heavenly father will do if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your what? Heart. It's this intense story that Jesus is saying, who are you in the story? He's asking Peter and I'm asking you, who do you most resonate with? Do you feel like you live so much with that theology of perfect that you most often believe that you are the king? You see, when we choose to live as the unmerciful servant, when we choose to recognize what, when we choose to not recognize what we have been forgiven for, we choose to live with unforgiveness. And unforgiveness is a false sense of power and control. Unforgiveness feels like this power that we have over somebody because what happens is we equate bitterness as a healthy boundary. We equate resentment as a healthy boundary. But only to find that in our relationships that bitterness and resentment just becomes bondage and baggage. And so how do we fight for this? See, forgiveness is an inward choice before it becomes an outward action. Let's just sit in that. It's a matter of the heart. You've heard it said, you know, just do the next right thing and emotions will follow. This is not true of forgiveness. Forgiveness begins in the heart. And we see this happen in the unmerciful servant. He was forgiven, but he didn't allow it to transform his heart. Forgiveness first has to be about the heart before we can befriend it to somebody else, before we can extend it to somebody else. And so the question that I want to answer that we're going to close with is how. How do we forgive? How do we seek forgiveness? So let's just go there. Seeking forgiveness is an act of befriending. It will require you to take that first step. And seeking forgiveness will require you to humbly acknowledge the wrong that you have done. There is power in confession. And that after you have confessed that wrong, you are going to have to be willing. It's going to require you to allow space for the wounded person to process. You see, when we often come to the realization that we have wounded somebody and we want to ask for forgiveness, we have had this on-ramp where we have processed our grief and our emotions and we want so greatly for that person to meet us there. But when we are the unmerciful servant, when we are the ones who need to ask to be forgiven, we have to be willing to give space and then accept the outcome of their response. To accept the outcome. And this is what's hard about forgiveness. Is that it's messy. And it doesn't always mean it will be reciprocated. 
But a person's unwillingness to forgive you doesn't prevent God from forgiving you. Hear that today. If you know that you have wounded someone and you have asked them for forgiveness and they have chosen not to receive it, God is saying, listen, remember, I am the perfect friend. And if you come humbly to me, if you confess your sin, I will forgive you. And that's the, the hard thing about forgiveness is it feels unfair. But here's the truth for no matter where you find yourself in a need of forgiveness or need to offer forgiveness, is that forgiveness doesn't excuse the behavior. Right? Forgiveness will not negate the consequences of our choices, but it does prevent that wound, that sin against you from destroying your heart. This is why God is so passionate about his son reconciling a huge mistake where this sin, which doesn't make sense in our relationship, changed everything. It all goes together. And in forgiveness, it's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. It's about your heart. And so as we close, what about those of you here today where you know that you have to offer forgiveness? And you are just tired. I mean, you have sat with this bitterness and resentment for so long. And you just thought it gave you power. You just thought it was, it was going to make that person know that they can never have access to your heart again. But in doing so, You've just stopped engaging in all relationships. That you've gone back to that theology of perfect. How do, how do you keep your heart from becoming the unmerciful servant? How do you choose to forgive? And offering forgiveness will require of you. It's that act of to humbly acknowledge your weaknesses and your shortcomings and your need for forgiveness and grace. Forgiveness will require you to be truthful about how you were wounded. We, we equate forgiveness as forgetfulness, but forgiveness is the process of grief and you will feel angry and angry is, anger is a gift from God. It is that anger that wakes us up to say, we've got to choose something different. I need to choose something different besides this bitterness. Right? The grief is what allows us to get to a place of acceptance that the wound happened. Feel the wound. Allow space for the wounder to receive your offering. This one's going to sit probably not well with some of you. I have seen this in my years of ministry through our church, through myself personally, time and time again, that when someone is truly broken and realizes the gift of grace that they have been given, when somebody says, I forgive you, would I mess up with my kids I just had this conversation today with Janiah, And I said, I'm really sorry for how I snapped at you. And she said, it's okay, mommy. Sometimes when we have sinned so greatly against somebody and we receive forgiveness, the true war begins of either receiving that forgiveness or living in the shame of our choice. And when you offer your forgiveness and that person doesn't respond in the way that you think they should in that theology of perfect, don't turn that into something that, that it's not, that they didn't receive it, but they have to process their wound and then accept the outcome of their response. You see, forgiveness is not true forgiveness unless we offer it regardless of how the person responds. How do I know this? Because it's what Jesus did for you. It's what he did for me. 
that he chose a death on the cross, a death that he did not deserve, that he was beaten, he was mocked, he was stripped of his clothes, he was humiliated, he was spit on, his clothes were bartered for, and in the midst of all of it, he says, my God, my God, forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. And if we want to befriend each other, we have to be willing to sit in the mess of our sin and learn how to reciprocate the healing power of forgiveness. Because here's the truth. Forgiveness will not always restore relationships. But it will restore your heart. Let's pray. Jesus, you knew that this tension of trying to figure out the difference between what is dysfunctional, what is abusive, what is getting walked on, what is an unhealthy relationship, like how do we discern the difference in all of it? And Father, I pray collectively that you would help us put down our theology of perfect and realize that we start from a place that we can first and foremost trust you, that you are a good and faithful God and that you will meet us in our pain, that you will teach us how to reconcile the parts that are broken by sin. Jesus, we invite you into our pain Would you help us live from a posture of knowing that even while we were sinners, you chose us. That you lavishly loved us by going first with forgiveness that would lead to a forever relationship. Would you help us lean into that truth that even if the forgiveness is not restorative of a relationship, that it will always bring us back to your heart. Be present in the wrestling. Help us with the next steps. And help us to be brave enough to go first with the gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, Hope City, we're going to respond with a song. So I'm going to invite you guys to stand. Um, And the first line of this song says, Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. And just as Trish taught with the parable of the servant and the king, this is where our capacity to forgive starts. It starts with a recognition of our utter unworthiness of his forgiveness and the, like, the significance of the forgiveness that he offers. And then it continues when we realize that this identity that we've been given in Christ has also been given to our brothers and sisters in Christ. That our brothers and sisters in Christ can also say, who am I that the highest king would welcome me? And so I'm just going to encourage us to stand on this truth of our identity in Christ that's been given to us as a free gift as we lean into worship this morning. Yes. 
peace that you've given to us. May we not forget what you've done for us, Jesus. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. us today. We had a great time with you, and we want to invite you back for another Sunday at Hope City next week at 9 30 and 11 a.m. online or in person. Have a great day. We'll see you all next week.